I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. I am so excited to continue our brand new sermon series on our journey of discipleship and just kind of talking about our mission and vision as a church. Last week, we kind of had an introductory sermon where we talked about knowing and following Jesus and being those who are with him and sent out uh, to preach. And tonight, we're going to be talking about the very first arena of the journey of discipleship, which is Worship, And that's what we just got finished doing, that we're worshiping Jesus for who he is and what he's done in our lives. And so tonight, if you could turn over to Luke chapter 5 uh, in your Bibles, maybe some of you have it on your smart device and you would turn that on and find Luke chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 1 and go down through verse 11. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and talking about this idea of worship. Here's what the Bible says. This is the word of God. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I'll let down the nets, and when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish for they, that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. It's a good word right there that Jesus reveals himself as the God of glory. And he says, don't be afraid. This is good news I have for you tonight. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. I want to preach tonight from Luke chapter 5 on the subject, Jesus is worthy of worship. How many of y'all believe that tonight? Jesus is worthy of our worship. In 2018, my wife Caroline and I went on a mission trip with uh, Highview, and we went over to Zimbabwe, Africa. Uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life. I couldn't wait to get over in uh, the motherland of my ancestors and really to kind of jump into the, the deep tradition and the culture of the people of the land. And I was so excited to get over there. And I'll never forget when we landed in Zimbabwe and got off the plane, the IMB missionaries who lived there, they greeted us. And they welcomed us, and they said, we're so glad that you guys are here uh, this week. And they began to kind of prep us and warn us for some of the good and the bad that we would see as we were there. Uh, they began to kind of prime our hearts, and they said, hey, I need you to understand something, that there are some of the, the most harsh living conditions that you're going to see in some of these rural villages that we're going to. Uh, they wanted to prepare our hearts. They wanted to say, hey, you're going to see some poverty. You're going to see some things that are going to kind of take you back. And I just got to be honest with you tonight. Even though they prepared my heart for that, I wasn't ready for some of the things that I saw when I was there. 
I'm walking through these villages and I'm going to these different huts that were made out of mud and they had straw for roofs. People didn't have electricity. They didn't have running water. The missionaries told us that some of the people, their families, their entire family lived off of one square meal a day. I went and I saw some little kids, these precious babies, and men, they had their, their ribs were showing and their clothes were tattered, and you could tell that they were sick, some of them, and their parents just didn't have the ability to take them, to get them any medicine or any aid, and it was just a devastating thing. It overwhelmed me by what I saw. But then what I saw in the midst of all of that, right, in the midst of all of that brokenness, in the midst of all of that, that, that poverty and, and those harsh living conditions, in the midst of that, what I saw among the Christians there was a worship that marked my life since 2018. Man, I saw people who literally they would walk miles in order to get to church. A couple of hours, one way, one direction. They walked miles. We had this, this baptism service, and Junior had drove. I don't know where he went, but Junior was on that trip with me. And they did this baptism service in this muddy lake in the middle of the woods. And they were baptizing people in there, and I said, hey, I, I love y'all, but I'm going to do the benediction from up here on the bank. I'm not getting in that water. I said, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee and make his face shine upon thee from up here on the bank, and we'll do it like that. But these were people who had no shoes on their feet, but they got into the presence of the Lord, and they danced with the joy of the Lord. These were people who didn't have drums and keys and and guitars, but they sang with with the fervor of the Lord. They prayed with the fervor of the Lord. They loved the word of God, and it was in their lips and in their hearts. What I saw there was people, and everything about their life said poverty. But they were some of the richest people that I've ever seen in my life. Everything in their life, they didn't have like all of the things that we think are essential to life, but what they had was Jesus. And what they showed me was that worship is not about what you have, it's about who you have. They showed me that worship is not even about what you're going through, it's about who's getting you through what you're going through. And they were people who worshiped. And this passage tonight is all about worship. It's all about who Jesus is, revealing who he is and what our response is to that. When we talk about this thing called worship, if you're taking notes tonight, I want to give you a definition for worship that I think will really change the way we approach church. Worship comes from a Latin word where the root of it is actually the word that is worth Ship. If you're taking notes tonight, worth-ship. And it's a meaning of the state of being valuable. So worship is a reaction to the value of something in our lives. Worship is a reaction to how much something is worth. And you and I know how to worship, don't we? I know we know how to worship because here's what worship looks like. Worship looks like giving up your entire Saturday to go out to the stadium and tailgate all day long. (laughs) Worship is something that means so much in your life that you're screaming and crying and yelling at 18 to 22-year-olds on how they play a ball game and the outcome of that ball game affects your life the rest of the week. We know how to worship, that there are things in our lives that have value. There are things in our lives that have meaning, and we have a response to that, and that's really what worship is all about. And how many of y'all know tonight that there is nothing more valuable, there is no one worth more in the entire universe than Jesus Christ, and our reaction to him every single day ought to show that. That's worship, is that we're seeing the beauty of Jesus and the value of Jesus, and we're responding to that. And here's the thing I was wrestling with this week. It's not that there's anything that actually rivals the value of Jesus. Amen? That there's nothing that actually is pushing and and, and competing with the value of Jesus. The problem is we can't always clearly see the value of Jesus in our lives. 
And we don't always respond properly to the value of Jesus in our lives. So what I want to show you from this story from Peter is what does worship actually look like? What does worship actually look like? Notice it again in the text. Back in verse 1, Peter kind of shows us what this looks like. He says this, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. So there's many people gathering around Jesus. They're following him because of all of the miracles that he did. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's another way of saying the Sea of Galilee for Bible readers who are familiar with that. And he saw two boats. She's okay, mom. She's okay. It's all good. She's okay. I'm serious. Stay there. It's good. He saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and they were washing their nets. And so when Jesus comes up on the Sea of Galilee, he sees a couple of boats. The fishermen are done with their fishing for the night. They're washing their nets, and and they're finished. And Jesus comes, and notice what happens in verse 3. He singles out Peter. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out in a little from the land, and he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. This is very significant that Jesus comes, and he sees all of these multitudes of people He sees a couple of different options, actually, of boats, and he chooses specifically to step into Peter's boat. That's significant. A lot of times, worship can't happen in our hearts. Worship can't happen in our lives until Jesus makes a personal experience in your life. Until Jesus steps into your boat, until Jesus steps into your life and reveals who he is and what he's come to do. Jesus, how many of y'all know that Jesus is an intentional God? Literally, the scriptures say in Luke chapter 19 that Jesus about himself, he says, I came to seek and to save the lost. He stepped into Peter's boat because he was looking for Peter specifically. There are some of you here who uh, you've been having friends who have been inviting you here and they've been texting you and they've been blowing your phone up so that you will come. I want you to know it's not because you have an annoying friend. It's because there's a God who's seeking you out tonight. There's an intentional God who wants a relationship with you. And so he steps into Peter's boat and he's about to rock Peter's world. Notice what it says in the next phrase, verse 4. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, if you know anything about fishing in this culture on the Sea of Galilee, the, the, the advice that Jesus gives is totally irrational. Uh, The reason why people fished at night was because during the day, the fish actually went too far out into the deep, and they were too far into the water that the nets couldn't reach them. The reason why they fished during the night was because at nighttime, the fish would come closer to the shore in order to feed on minnows, and they were in the shallow enough water for the nets to be able to reach them. And so if you were to YouTube how to fish in Galilee, What they would say to you is, here's the two things you got to do. You got to fish at night and you got to do it close to the shore. Here's Jesus and he steps into Peter's boat and he says, I want you to go out to the deep water and I want you to fish during the day. It makes no sense. It's totally irrational. Peter's actually a professional fisherman and he lets Jesus know just how much he thinks about his advice. Notice what he says in verse 5. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. In other words, Jesus, you stick to the preaching and let me stick to the fishing. (laughs) Jesus, I don't come into your pulpit and tell you how to preach. Don't tell me how to fish. Peter had some experience. He was a professional fisherman and everything in his experience told him where the fish would be. Jesus told him something that was irrational and opposite, and it rocked his world. He goes on to say, man, I'll oblige you, but at your word, I'll let down your nets. And here's the challenge I want to push to your neighborhood tonight. How many times does it happen to you and I that God tells us something to do, and we think we know better than him how we ought to do it? 
God gives us a word from the scriptures on how we ought to speak and how we ought to act and how we ought to react. And we're like, oh, no, nah, Jesus, I've been watching some YouTube videos, Jesus, and I know how this thing ought to work. And I know what's better for my life than you do. And we don't trust him and obey him. Here's what Jesus is about to show Peter. Jesus is about to show Peter, Peter, you might know some things about the fish, but Peter, I made the fish. Peter, you might know some things about the lake and about the water, but I made the water. I made the lake. Peter, I made you, and I'm about to show you that you don't know everything you think you do. Guys, if you're taking notes tonight, here's the thing I want to challenge you with. Sometimes God's got to push you out to the deep end and push you beyond your experience and push you beyond your expertise and push you beyond your education to show you that you don't know just what you think you know. You're not as wise as you think you are. You're not as good as you think you are. And Jesus is about to reveal himself to Peter. Here's what happens in verse 6. Notice what it says. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. And they came and filled up both boats and they began to sink. Jesus did an earth nature defying miracle right here. Jesus went to the irrational place. He went to the place that made no sense. He went to the place that you would have never caught fish, and he caught more fish than they could ever hope for or imagine. He reveals himself. There's some things that Peter learned about Jesus that you and I need to learn about Jesus tonight. Number one, Jesus revealed that he is beyond the laws of nature, y'all. Jesus is not bound by what is rational. I want you to know that tonight. Jesus is not bound by what is logical. Jesus is not bound by what makes sense. The Bible says that the cross of Christ is foolishness to the human heart. Peter found out about Jesus that there's nothing impossible for him. How many of y'all would say you've tried him and you found it to be true? There's nothing impossible for Jesus. Jesus found out, or Peter found out about Jesus, that he's not just some ordinary preacher. He's actually God who's sovereign over the heavens and over the earth. And what's crazy about that that really blows my mind is that here you have the God who's sovereign over the universe, who's outside of time, who's not bound by nature's laws, and he wants to come and get in Peter's boat. Man, that ought to do something to us tonight, that the God of the universe wants to get in your boat and have a relationship with you. I've said this before. If if, if, if we knew the things about you that God knows about you, we wouldn't let you in the church building tonight. But God knows those things, and he still loves you, and he's still stepping into your boat and still wants a relationship with you. Peter, yes, Peter learns about Jesus, that Jesus actually knows better than his experience. Somebody ought to write that down tonight. Jesus knows better when he speaks to you and he tells you how you ought to react to things in life. When he speaks to you and he tells you how you ought to treat your neighbor and speak to your spouse. Even though all of your experience tells you one thing, Jesus knows the way to life. Jesus knows the way to life. And here's the other thing that Peter found out. Peter found out that he and Jesus are not equals. They are not equals. Jesus, listen to this, Jesus was able to catch more fish in a moment than Peter caught all night as a professional fisherman. That's who Jesus is. And here's how the cross works in our lives. We spend our entire lives trying to do enough and be righteous enough and be good enough to clean ourselves. And you could never do it in a thousand lifetimes, but Jesus did it in a moment with a one-time sufficient sacrifice on the cross. Jesus and Peter are not equals, and he revealed some things about himself. And what we're about to see is that it did something in Peter's life. Worship, if you're taking notes tonight, worship is a rhythm of revelation and response. 
Worship is a rhythm where we see the value of Christ and we see the power and the majesty of Christ and it ought to do something to us. If you can come into the church building, friends, and hear the word of God preached and sing the songs of the gospel and go into community group and study and study and study and it not do something in your heart, then you had church, but you didn't see Jesus. If you can encounter this man and it not do something in your life, then you might have had some religion, but man, you didn't taste the goodness of Jesus Christ. There's a rhythm of revelation and response. Jesus reveals who he is. He is God all by himself. And there's an impact that it makes on Peter's life. I want you to notice the first one in verse 8. Number one is a response of confession. Response of confession. Notice what happens again in verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Think about that. In the presence of Christ, the brother couldn't even stand on his feet, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I want somebody to write this down. When you get a clear picture of Jesus, you get a clear picture of your sin. The closer you get to God, the closer you get to the presence of the Lord Jesus and his holiness, the more keenly aware you become of how far you fall short. Jesus said, depart from me, for I am a sinful uh, man. I grew up in this little small town called Winnebow, North Carolina. Don't worry about looking it up on a map. You won't find it. It's too small of a town. And I came out of this little small town, and I was a pretty good football player. Okay, and I believe because I was in this small town of Winnebow, North Carolina, that I was like the, the, the greatest thing, the hottest thing smoking in the game of football. Like I was God's gift of football, I thought, in my mind. Then I got to the University of Louisville as a bunch of D1 football players running around. And let me tell you something, Brother Steve. It took two minutes in a D1 football practice to realize I wasn't in Winnebow anymore. (laughs) The Bible says that Jesus is holy, that God is holy, that he is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. And you can't enter into the presence of holiness and not be aware that you are a sinner that you fall short, that you have not pursued his ways in all of the ways that you should. I want you to hear uh, what Isaiah says about having this encounter with a holy God. Listen to this, Isaiah 6, verses 3 through 5. This is a response of confession. Notice what it says. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is filled of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here's a man, y'all, here's a prophet, a man of God that God called to go and speak to Israel and call them to repentance. How many of y'all would say he's probably a pretty godly person? But in the presence of God, he said, my lips aren't even clean enough for such a task. The pathway to freedom is confession. When we really see who Jesus is, our response ought to be, God, forgive me. Have mercy on me. God, I'm sorry that I thought I was wiser than you. I'm sorry that I haven't been obeying your word. Forgive me. Have mercy on me, for I'm a sinner. Here's the good news tonight is the Bible says that if you'll do that, if you'll confess your sin, that Jesus is faithful and he's just to forgive your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. How many of y'all, that's good news for you tonight? Like many times, we can't worship with joy because our hands are weighed down by the guilt and the shame that we bring in this room. But Jesus can free you to worship him. He can free us tonight by his blood. And your first response in his presence ought to be confession. Here's the second one. Our second response, Peter's second response, is a response of amazement. Amazement. Notice what it says in verse 9. 
For he and all who were with him were, what's your Bible say? Astonished. They were blown away at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you were amazed at the goodness of God in your life? When's the last time that you were just amazed, you were blown away that a God so good could love a person like you? I find myself, I, I kid a lot about myself that I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of Baptocostal a little bit. I think that's how I identify. I'm a little Baptocostal. I love when people are lively in worship. I love when people are talking back to me in my sermon. I love that. Not everybody worships the same way. Some people are, you know, more expressive. Some people are in their safe Baptist zone, and they're just kind of right here, you know, <laughs> arms by the side. They're just swaying back and forth. Some people are more internal, and they're more cerebral in the way that you do it. But here's the thing. If you have seen Jesus and experienced and tasted the goodness of Jesus, there ought to be some kind of response in your life. David received back the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God that had gone from his city, and there was reaction. He began to dance, a Pentecostal dance, by the way. <laughs> the, the, the Israelites, they were released by uh, God's power out of Egypt, and there was this, this great exodus, and they go to the Red Sea, and God drowned their enemies in the sea. There was a reaction. They sang about it. There's different reactions, but there ought to be some reaction in our life. There ought to be some amazement in our life if we've truly experienced the goodness of God. Here's the challenge. Again, if I can come to your neighborhood and really challenge you tonight, maybe step on some of your toes. I believe the reason why that doesn't happen, why we're sometimes we get bored with Jesus and bored with the gospel, is you've forgotten just how far he's brought you. You've forgotten in your life that you hadn't always been so saved and holy and sanctified tonight. You've forgotten that there were some times in your life when you rode up into church on Sunday after tearing the club up on Saturday. You've forgotten that there were some times in your life where you weren't always such a great faithful husband and great faithful wife and great faithful father. You've forgotten that there were some addictions in your life and some strongholds in your life, some things in your life that you couldn't get out of, even if you wanted to get out of them, but God stepped in and he showed mercy in your life. And if we want to have an amazement at the goodness of God, we ought to have this practice of looking back over the rearview mirror of our life and saying, if it were not for the grace of God in my life, I don't know where I would be. These brothers get a, a, a glimpse of Christ. They get a gl glimpse of his glory and of his grace. And they say like the great hymn writer used to say, oh, how marvelous. How wonderful, and my song shall ever be. There's amazement in their life. There ought to be amazement in our life. First response is confession. Second response is amazement. Here's the third and final one, and we'll go home on this. The third response to Jesus is full surrender. Full surrender. Notice what it says again in verse 11. When they had brought their boats to the land, they left a little bit of stuff. When they had brought their boats to the land, they, they, they left most of their stuff. And when they brought their boats to the land, they left everything and they followed him. Friends, worship is not just what we do here on Sunday nights at 6.30. Worship is your entire life. Yeah. Worship is not just about singing songs. Worship is about how what we sing in these songs impacts your day, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Worship is your entire life being surrendered to the majesty of Jesus. 
Worship is about how you enter work and your job on Monday and how you work with integrity when nobody's looking but Jesus. Worship is about when God is calling you to do some hard things in your life. How many of you would say there's times when Jesus asked me to do things that I don't want to do? But worship is saying that when I weigh you versus the, the, the fleshly things, the fleshly passions of my life, you weigh more. And so I'm following you. Worship has to do with the way you speak to your spouse and your children. Worship has to deal with your, your money. Worship has to deal with your calendar. Here's the thing. If God's got you and he's truly got all of you, then he'll get all of the things that he's calling you to do. Worship is about full surrender. And here's the burden of this sermon tonight is what I want you to see is that Jesus is worth that. He's worth anything that he's asking us to do. And the way that we respond to him shows that. I want to show you a couple of passages in closing in Revelation chapter 4. Here's where all of human history is headed. It's for the worship of Jesus. I want to tell you something. If you don't enjoy worship on earth, you're not going to like heaven very much. Heaven is going to be eternal worship of King Jesus who's worthy of our worship. Listen to what it says in Revelation 9, verses, uh, Revelation 4, verses 9 through 11. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne. And worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Here's what I want you to know. There's going to come a day when everything we've accomplished in this life all that we've earned in this life, all that we give all of our time and our devotion to, we're going to take all of those things and throw them at his feet because he's more worthy. That's where life is going. It's all about the worship of Jesus. And then notice what the Bible says in Revelation 5, 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Listen, there is nobody like Jesus who's died for sin and risen from the dead and is alive today to reign forever. There's nobody like Jesus who has the power in his blood to gather people from every tribe, tongue, and nation and place them in the same family. Jesus is in a class all by himself family. Jesus is God all by himself. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's worthy of our worship. And I want you to know tonight there's coming a time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. There's coming a time when kings will bow before Jesus. There's coming a time when presidents will bow before Jesus. There's coming a time in human history where Democrats are going to bow before Jesus. Before you amen too loud, there's coming a day and time when Republicans will bow before Jesus. There's coming a time when all nations will bow before Jesus. The rich and famous will bow before Jesus. The poor will bow before Jesus. Pentecostals and Baptists will bow before Jesus. Catholics and Buddhists and Hindus will bow before Jesus. Muslims will bow before Jesus. Atheists will bow before Jesus. Blacks will bow before Jesus. Whites will bow before Jesus. Latinos and Asians and Arabs and Africans. I'm going to bow. You're going to bow because Jesus is Lord. And here's the thing I want you to know, is that on that day, some people are going to bow as a response to his grace in the gospel. Some people are going to bow willingly, and they're going to say, because of how you've loved me, I want to worship you. 
And then some people are going to bow because he's going to break their kneecaps in judgment. Because he's a holy God. But the invitation to you and I tonight, listen, don't zone out on me. We're almost done. The invitation, the good news is that he wants you to bow right now by grace. He's inviting you right now to realize that he is God of God. That he's the God of creation and he came to step into your boat to have a relationship with you. He died on the cross and he rose from the grave and he's saying, respond to me. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much that you have purchased our right to worship. If there's a person here under the sound of my voice who's not fully surrendered, would you call them? God, would you invite them to receive your grace, to receive your mercy, to know and understand that there is nobody like the Lord? We love you, God. We thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you for your kindness. We pray that you would invite us in to give you all of us in worship.